Okay, let's get started. Let's get started with today. Um, before we talk more about sampling, you know, following up on the stuff that we had left over from last time, and before I get into descriptors, uh, a few announcements. First, I was asked to um, point to your attention, bring to your attention the BA Peer Mentoring Scheme. While well, you are in your first year and you're about to enter your second year, right? So that means uh, you can become now a mentor for next year's first year students, right? And uh, maybe you benefited this year already from a mentor, or maybe you didn't and want to be a, have better ideas about how a mentor can be, right? So I think it's an incredibly useful scheme, especially for guys you know who are in lots of beginning business university life. This is different. This can be helpful sometimes, at the very least, to take. Um, maybe some, some fears or doubts of why and uh, calm people down. So if you're interested in that, um, go on to SysWeb. Apparently there's more information on this or contact my Dennehy email address or go to the group. Okay, so that's uh, the first announcement. Uh, the second announcement, you know guys, I'm all, I'm all up for new technology, you know me. Um, I think whatever helps you guys to learn, why not embrace it, right? Why go for it and, uh, and really, really have it? Uh, at the very least, it's one less excuse uh, to not study. <laughs> so um, I think uh, it shouldn't be it shouldn't be about getting access to material, but actually really sitting down and studying stuff, right? And for this course, you have to study. That's just how it is, right? There, there's going to be uh, some things you need to study for. But whatever I can do to make that easier and uh, whatever is doable, I'm I'm open to that. So one of you came up with a suggestion to um, have a podcast. Well. Uh, I spent a little time at the weekend on this, so now actually you'll find this lecture on iTunes. So just Google, or Google on iTunes, yeah. just search sociological analysis in iTunes and you find the podcast. It's nothing fancy, it's really just the lectures, it's just the audio stream from the lectures, right? A podcast I would probably design slightly differently, but I can see it, um, I can see it being useful for some of you guys to have the opportunity to, I don't know, to listen to the audio stream, download it and do with it whatever you want. So we are on iTunes. Uh, if you are, uh, an, I don't know, an Android user or Windows user or whatever, um, you also find the podcast URL over here. Don't worry, I put it all on Blackboard as well. So if you know how podcasts work, you have to subscribe to it and so on. If you don't, ask some of your peers who do or who are interested in this. I think um, you learn the most from your peers anyways, right? So long, long after you forgot about all these lectures, about all these guys sitting in front of you with beards, you remember the folks that were with you in this class. So this is the podcast, another little fun in our class. Okay, last announcement. As I had already mentioned at the very beginning of this, uh, of this term, uh, I'm not going to be around next Wednesday. So there will be no lecture on Wednesday, the 13th of April. But you'll have lots of podcasts to listen to. Right now there are only three up there from the first three lectures, but hopefully I'll manage to put the other ones up there as well. Okay. So far about the announcements. So let's get back. Let's get started with uh, the substantive part of this lecture. More on sampling and on descriptors. Take out your phones, tablets, toothbrushes, whatever you use. Windows, Android, Apple, I don't care. And uh, I have two questions for you.
Okay, this is a difficult question. This is a difficult question. Um, homogeneous, meaning uh, should they all be the same, right? Uh, or similar in their characteristics. And heterogeneous, meaning should they be different in their characteristics? Yeah. We will talk about that today. It was in the readings. And in stratified sampling, uh, the, the units in the strata should be homogeneous. Homogeneous. Yeah. They should be the same. The idea is that you separate the world into different groupings, let's say men and women, and then you want to pick proportionally as many men and women out of your whole population. Right? So then you want to go into, into these strata and pick, pick some, uh, some individuals out of them. So when you group them together according to certain attributes or age groups, uh, that's what we call a strata, yeah? like kind of putting it, stratifying your, your sample and then choosing from there. Heterogeneous, meaning they should be different. Actually, we'll come back to that when we talk about cluster sampling. Your units should be heterogeneous inside the groups. But I will come back to that. That's sort of two of those probability samplings that we haven't talked about yet, but they were in, in the readings. Okay, next question. On which scale? It says, should, you know, should a variable have to be at least to calculate the median? Okay, to answer this question, you essentially need to have two pieces of information. You need to know two things. One is, what the hell is nominal, ordinal, ratio, and interval? Uh, we had talked about that before. And the second one, what the hell is a median? Yeah. So the correct answer here is ordinal. Let me, let, me, let me talk about these different scales again. Right? So you can, you can collect information, and this information, or then you know, they represent them in variables, they are on a certain scale. And with that we mean, um, do they have essentially an order in them? When we talk about something being on the nominal scale, there's no order. Right? There's just male or female. There's nothing I can rank higher. Or what are you going to do this afternoon? Right? I don't know. You're going to hang out, you're going to study, you're going to read. There's no, there's no ordering here. Right? So if I would ask a question like that, then the response variable is on the nominal scale. That's essentially really just different categories. And these different categories are just different categories and that's all there is. There's no relationships between these different categories. Think about it as male and female and there's no ordering that you can underlie here. Then we move on to the ordinal scale. There we have an ordering in our responses. How much time do you spend on Facebook? 0 to 30 minutes, 30 to 60 minutes, 60 to 90 minutes, more than 90 minutes. Right? You tick these boxes, and at the end I get four different response categories as well, but I know there's an ordering here. I know that the person who ticked more than 90 minutes spends more time on Facebook than the person who ticked uh, 60 to 90 minutes. There's an ordering in my response variable. And when we have that, then a variable is on the ordinal scale. The next one is the ratio scale. The ratio scale is, uh, um, is essentially where, um, there are, where there are differences, where there are differences between, between two variables like temperature degrees. I know 10 degrees higher is as much as 10 degrees lower. There's not just an ordering here, but there's sort of the distances. And the last one, there's also an absolute, an absolute zero point. But you know, go back to the, to the lectures where I had talked about that um, to, to get into that. So that's sort of the first thing. Uh, the second one we need to know, and that's the stuff that I was going to talk about in the second part of this lecture, are averages, mean, median, and mode. The median is 
essentially the median of a variable is the value is the value that just lies in the middle of of all the people that answer the question. So the median is, um, let's say I ask you how much time you spend um, studying for this class, and maybe you know there's some outliers, some people don't study at all, others study a lot, you know, that's just how it is. And, uh, and then the median would be, if I would line you up, if I would line you up in a long line, according to what you, what you said, how many minutes you spent preparing for this class, and then I walk along this line, and exactly when I hit 50% of the people, I stop. That's the median. And then I ask you, and you are the person just in the middle, there as many people to the right as to the left on this long line, where I set you up and align according to, according to how much time you spend preparing for this class. And then I set in front of this person, after having passed 50%, and I ask this person how much time you spent, that's the median. And that's different from the mean. The mean is if I would sum everything up and then divide it by the number of people. And as you will see, I have some examples. Mean and median do not necessarily have to be the same. Right? If I would have one person who just goes nuts and just spends all the time on this class, which is great, you know, um, but then this is an outlier, and then this person would increase the average dramatically to the top. Right? Same way a person who doesn't spend anything, any time at all, would, would decrease the average a lot to the bottom, right? While actually a lot of people might be in between somewhere, right? So the median might be a better way of, uh, of getting an, a, a feeling for what the average here actually is. Right? So average is not, is not equal average. But now you see, for the median, I need to line you up in this long line. Right? So in order to be able to do that, I need to, have I need to have some way to order you guys. That means whatever I'm interested in calculating the median about, it needs to be on the ordinal scale. If I ask you, um, I don't know, are you male or female, and uh, I, cannot, I cannot line you up in an order here, right? and then I cannot walk 50, so what does that mean? Right? There's, no, there's no ordering there, which means I cannot calculate an average out of that. Right? That's what a median is, but we'll come back to that in the second part of the lecture. Okay. So what I brought with me is uh, the second part of last time you know, that we didn't manage to, to go through. So we'll follow up on probability samplings and then I will introduce, I will move into what we call descriptive analysis where we talk about averages, where we talk about median, mean and mode. Then I also brought some other stuff with me but let's see, most likely we won't be able to get there but it doesn't matter, we will come back to that at the beginning of next week where we talk more about drawing inferences from what we actually, um, the data that we collect. Okay, so remember, so what is this whole sampling thing about? It's really about the fact that it's most often uh, impossible or extremely costly or difficult to study entire populations. Sometimes we're able to do that. Now I told you this story where I was in, when I was in Sweden, we studied uh, uh, the whole population of Sweden, everybody who had ever lived in Sweden in the last 30 years, which is creepy, it's really creepy if you think that, I don't know, scientists, social scientists can do that, but that's sort of why Sweden is sociologist's paradise. Um, but often, often that's not feasible, you know, it's not possible, or uh, it's actually also too costly for it as well. Right? So sampling is this idea that instead of studying the whole population, we select, we select some people out of the population we study them, and then we draw conclusions from the sample for the whole population. That's the idea. Right? So that's if I if I want to know um, how much time do you spend studying for this class? You know, it could be tedious to ask every single one of you. So I pick uh, 20 people out of you or 10. I interview you guys, and based on that, I can make an inference or I can draw conclusions about the whole population. And as you see, there are obviously there are problems because it depends on who do I pick, right? Who do I pick? What are kind of the answers that I get? Is this representative? Is this sort of um, uh, can I can I really draw conclusions about the general population from that? And that's sort of where these different sampling strategies come into play. So last time I had uh, I had uh, this chart, you know how this whole sampling thing works. Define the population. Let's say all the students in this class, all the students who are registered in this class then define a sampling frame, which is essentially 
getting hold of a list of all those people in the population, which very often you know, it doesn't, doesn't match one-to-one -one because it's just really difficult. There might be some students who are registered for the stars, but they, I don't know, they practically dropped out, but they couldn't be bothered to deregister so far, or others who joined this class who are sitting in and they are not registered for this class. So you see how this can be, can be tricky or how we actually need to be very careful about this distinction between the population and the sampling frame. Because essentially, in the next step, we draw our sample from this list of people that we have. Yeah. So, technically, everything that I learn from the sample is only about the sampling frame, right? In the ideal world, sampling frame and population overlap, but often, practically, they don't. Okay, so then I have sort of this list of people. Now I need to think about who, who am I going to interview? Who am I going to invite to my experiment? Who am I going to ask to fill out a survey? All these wonders that you can do to study folks. You know, it doesn't have to be quantitative stuff. It can be qualitative. It can be whatever. Right? It can be whatever. You cannot study everybody, so you need to, need to make a selection somehow. And then there are these two broad categories, how you can go about that. First one is called non-probability sampling, and the second one, probability sampling. So we, we talked about non-probability sampling the last time, and that's essentially the bad stuff. Yeah? That's kind of the stuff where you, where you just out of convenience, I don't know, I select the folks who sit in the first row, or out of convenience, uh, I don't know, I, I select the people who walk by while I'm sitting in the, in the, in the arts cafe and have my coffee, so that's, that's often something you can, you can use that, it's especially I don't know, if you want to explore something, you know, if you want to I don't know, quickly uh, um, set up a study, um, which might not necessarily, to get an idea, but very likely this approach is not representative for the whole population. You know? So that's something you need to be aware about. On the top of that, on the top of that, I said earlier that uh, uh, you, you sample out of a population. The thing is, or the beauty when you use probability sampling, you can actually you can actually calculate the error that you are expected to make because you didn't interview everybody. Right? So you make inferences, or you I don't know you you come up with conclusions. This is sort of what my twenty people say about how much time they they spend. And uh, if I've done a proper probability sample, I can say something about how likely I am off with that number that I generated from the actual time that everybody, uh, the whole population spends preparing for this class. So that's sort of some stuff down the road. You do not necessarily need to know that. If you are interested in that, I think it's fascinating how we can actually, how can actually deal with the stuff that we don't know. Yeah, we can actually factor that in and uh, we, can, we can calculate the stuff that we don't know, which is, which is crazy when you think about it. But um, this is where probability sampling comes into play. And in probability sampling, before you select somebody into your sample, before I choose some of you here and ask you about how much time you spent, I have a clear idea about how likely it is to choose one particular individual before, before I make this selection. Right? So there are clearly assigned probabilities. While in the non-probability sampling, that's not the case. Right? I don't know who's going to walk by the arts cafe later on. Right? Well, I don't know. I don't know who's going to sit in a in a in, in a certain row at a certain moment. Right? While with probability sampling, I have a clear probability that I can assign to each one and single one of you to end up in my sample. Okay, and then there are different kinds of probability samplings, and I will walk you through four of them. So the first four of them, or the fifth one, is sort of meddled together with the, with the cluster sampling as well. But just as a, um, to briefly recapitulate, you know, this is sort of the four different non-probability samplings that we talked about. Convenient sampling, snowball sampling, quota sampling, and we didn't get to judgment sampling, but it's not that important. Uh, the other ones are more important, so I leave it there. But you can follow up on the podcast once it's up to um, listen to that again. So let me move on to the probability sampling. Four different ones that I want to talk with you about. And the four that I want to talk with you about are simple random sampling, systematic sampling, stratified sampling, and cluster sampling. Okay, what do all these things mean? Well, as I said, the overarching thing that all they have in common is that each member 
of the sampling frame, right, of my, of my list of all the students that I have who are registered for this class, they have a, a known non-zero probability of being selected. And then we have simple random sampling, which means that I pick individuals by chance. Right? I have, I don't know, I have 500 students registered for this class, so I assign each one of you a probability of 1 divided by 500, or I don't know, or how much I want to, want to uh, sample, and then I roll a dice, and uh, let's say, I don't know, I generate a random number, 1 to 500, and to, to uh, if whatever number comes up, that student I select based on the alphabetical order of your names or something like that. Right? So that's a true random sampling. Why the systematic sampling is another one where I kind of are more systematic. Let's say I pick, I, again, I, kind of, I sort you alphabetically and I know out of 500 students I want to, I want to interview 50. So that means I um, select every 10th individual. I start somewhere randomly between 0 and, and, and 10 or 1 and 10 and then I pick every 10th individual. You see there's also sort of random, but at the same time there's some, some sy systematic component in there, yeah, which actually can lead to better results than simple random sampling. And then stratified sampling, which was this stuff where the one question was about, where we group individuals first together according to certain groups, male and female, or certain age groups and so on, and then proportional to what I want to have to the general population I pick. Let's say if I know there are 50% um, male and 50% female in this class, then I want to pick 50% of my individuals from the sample from the male group and 50% from the female group. Yeah. That's then it's just stratified sampling, which, which moves us away from this random picking, you know, where I could actually, if I choose 50 individuals, I could end up with 50 male, or I could end up with 50 females, purely by chance. It's a small chance, but there is a chance that this actually would happen. Right? So then you could argue, well, maybe that's not necessarily representative of the whole thing. Certainly not when it comes to certain characteristics of individuals. So that's sort of where, where actually all of the three systematic, stratified, and cluster sampling move away from the simple random sampling, and uh, that's what they introduce. But let me get started with that and talk about one after each other. Okay, so the first one, simple random sampling. Now, as I already outlined, you know, that's sort of um, uh, um, a sampling procedure where I just really, really pick individuals completely by chance. Practically how this works is I assign everybody in my population a number, consecutive number, 1 to 500, each one of you gets a number, and then I randomly generate a number from 1 to 500. Right? And whoever's this number comes up is in my sample. That's how it goes. And now you see a little example, you know, at the top, now there's sort of a little um, this is a graph I have from the Baby book, um, where there are 100, 100 individuals in, in this, in this you know, hypothetical population that we have. Some of them are male, others are female. Right? You see it at the, at the graph at the top. And now, um, in order to select 10 individuals out of this population of 100, the random sampling procedure goes like that. that first, each individual, in whatever order they are there, you know, it doesn't really matter, they get assigned a number, one, two, three, four, five, and so on, up to 100. That's how it goes. And then one generates a random number. And actually, here it works with a fancy random table, table of random numbers, and one looks at the last two digits, and so on. But just think of that as just some random numbers that are being reproduced. And then I see I start somewhere, and then I see here. Um, so um, I, I, I start somewhere uh, with, uh, let's say, 30, you know, and that's sort of with the third element in my random list. Again, there's a random number being generated. Where should I start? And that individual with this ID number 30 gets selected and ends up in the sample. The next individual that we see is 60, uh, 67 ends up in our random number that we generated. Don't, don't get confused by, I don't know, why these numbers have five digits, you know? Right now, we're just looking at the last two here. This is just very general random numbers that you can use for much, I don't know, for other purposes then as well. So um, then, then individual with the ID number 67 ends up in the sample, and so on and so forth. And this goes on until I have the 10 people that I want to have. So that's very simple random sampling. 
There's another example that I have, and again, we have sort of a population, now there are just 12 individuals, and now I added some colors to that. Actually, we come back to that later on. Right now, the colors don't really matter. You know, they could be different attributes, could be, I don't know, uh, age groups, could be preferences, could be, could be ethnicities, could be whatever, but attributes that our individuals have. I have 12 individuals. I want to select four out of them. I generate, first of all, I assign each one a consecutive number, one, two, three, four, five, and so on. Right? And then I generate four random numbers. In this case, I generated two, 10, five, and eight. Now, the, the key here is that each one in your, in your population has the same, has the same probability here. Right? So each number to come up here has the same probability. It's equally likely that, I don't know, I came up with number two or with number three or number four. Now, there's, no, there's no bias in here. It's like rolling a dice. Yeah. Only that the numbers, you know, could be whatever uh, the number in your population is. And then those individuals end up in your sample. So that's simple random sampling. So what are the advantages and disadvantages of that? Well, first, um, you don't need to know anything about your population. That's actually pretty cool. You don't need to know anything about your population. You don't need to know um, how many males are there, how many females are there, what is the age group, and so on. The idea is that if you somehow manage to, to, to give everybody the same probability to end up in your sample, it doesn't matter. Because then, then you are likely to have individuals in your sample who are sort of similar to the general population. Right? Because individuals with certain attributes have the same probability to end up there. So that's actually where they are really powerful, because we don't need to know about, um, I don't know, um, uh, what, is the, what is the composition of ethnicities in Ireland, uh, what is the uh, male-female ratio, and so on. We don't need to know about these things. We don't need the fancy census data right, to, for, to, to have our, uh, our sampling proportions, but uh, we just randomly pick individuals if everybody has the same probability. So on the top of that, it's also very easy to analyze. You know, many statistical analysis that you do, they actually require, they, they build on this idea that however you selected your sample was in a random way. Once you've done that, then you can, you can move on and you can calculate, okay, how much error am I likely to have in there the course of my sampling? Like how much sampling error am I going to have? If you don't have a probability sample, you cannot do these kind of things. So several analysis when we want to analyze data, or even you know when you do when you do uh, when you do interviews, you know as I said, this doesn't have to be quantitative stuff. It can be qualitative stuff as well. If you just interview some people, how can you and you just and you, and you select people out of your convenience, you know, just the people who you know? How can you generalize to a broader population? And that's sort of a big mistake that people make. They they make that. I see that. I read that in master's thesis and so on. And I think, God, man, what are you doing? You use a convenient sample, or you use another sampling procedure that is not probability, but you treat it as if it was probabil probabilistic. Yeah? And then, then you, you can't do that. That's sort of a big mistake, and then you cannot really generalize. You can only say something about the people that you selected. But as soon as you have some form of probability sampling, you can say more about the people beyond your sample. You can say something about the people that you didn't interview, and that's often what we, what we want to get, right? Or that's, I don't know, what I find stimulating, what I find, find interesting. Okay, some disadvantages. Um, well, it's really, it's really uh, uh, um, oblivious towards uh, the, the researcher's expertise. So if I know that some people are not likely to, to answer to my questions or they are not here, so on, doesn't really take that into account. And uh, the last one, clustered samples are possible. What that means is that if I, select, if I select 10 individuals out of my 100 population, you know, I could end up with 10 males. Or I could end up with 10 females. It's very unlikely, but it's possible. Right? It's still a completely random sample. And that's something that we often have difficulties to, to, get, to come to grips with, that sometimes, sometimes certain patterns that we observe are just random. It looks as if there's something there, but it's not. Just pure randomness. So there's this story. I have some more about that um, in another slide, but probably we won't get there. You know, there was this thing a few years back when mobile phone masks became popular. You know, I don't know, nowadays we all have our phones. Yeah. But that started off not that long ago, and there have to be mobile phone masks everywhere for this to work. You don't actually see them. Yeah. And then people were at the beginning 
very afraid of uh, of you know the, the the waves that get sent out because of this mobile phone mass if that causes cancer. And then you know there were some studies that actually nowadays studies showed no it doesn't. There's no effect uh, when you have your phone here or even when you when you are next to a phone mast, you're not more likely to get cancer. But then once in a while it happens, and there was this case in the UK in this little village somewhere, can't remember where it was, Wishaw, where um, you know in the period five years after this mobile phone mast was set up, there was a community. It was a small little village of five of of of, uh, of uh, 20 households, and out of those 20 households, nine individuals got cancer in the period when the phone mask was up. So everybody thought, there must be an association here, right? Actually what happened, people, they tear down the phone mast and they prevented uh, telecom to, um, to put it up again, and so on, it was a huge outcry and so on. But as studies showed, there was, no, there was no relationship here. Sometimes things just happen by chance. You know, if I just randomly, randomly assign, I don't know, some people who, uh, who, uh, who, who, who are likely to get something in a population, it's not going to be all with, with equal distances between each other. Sometimes they are sort of clusters, sometimes they are farther away, and so on. That's just pure chance. So pure chance leads to these groupings sometimes. And then uh, we often assign meaning to them, although there really isn't. So that's something to keep in mind when we talk about randomness, but I have some more about that, and I think it's fascinating to think about randomness more generally anyway. Let me move on to the next, to the second type of probability sampling that I want to mention here. It's uh, what we call systematic sampling. Systematic sampling. Systematic sampling is essentially you know, the simple idea that I select, let's say, I line you up in whatever fashion, I don't care, and then I select every tenth individual. Every tenth individual ends up in my sample. That's systematic sampling. So it's very simple. It's very, it's actually, it's very related. You can, you can actually show you know, that um, when you assign your individuals, if, when you line them up completely by chance, systematic sampling is actually the same as random sampling that we had before. But now you can do something else. Now you can line your individuals up according to certain attributes. So now when you look at this, uh, the 100 individuals that we have, again, sort of from the baby book, um, now they are sorted according to, first they are all the males listed, and then there are, there are 44 males, and then there are 50, 55, and then there are some more, more females after that, and then there are some males again. Now there's some, some sorting in here according to, I don't know, maybe it's age group or, or something else like that. And then I go and start somewhere at randomly, and then I pick every tenth individual, and depending on that, those individuals, they end up in my sample. Yeah. So that's sort of a form of probability sampling, where I can, on the top of that, depending on how I line my individuals up, I can assure that I don't end up with these extremely clustered samples. Now it cannot happen that I only have males, or only females, in my sample because I had the males lined up first and then the females after them. And so that's systematic sampling, which is sort of oftentimes better than random sampling. Advantages, you know, if order of units is random, systematic sampling is exactly the same as random sampling. That's what I, what I just said. Uh, if order is uh, according to a certain attribute, clustered selection according to this attribute is eliminated. Yeah? So I cannot, I don't end up with only males or only females in the people that I actually study. <laughs> So again, I sort of I select individuals randomly, but somehow I make sure that there's both males and females in there. Okay, so here I have uh, another example for that. Uh, you see, I line up my individuals; they have different different <coughs> colors. Now I line them up just completely, completely random, you know, as they were. I don't sort them according to to their color, and then I sample every third. <coughs> individual, what I could have also done is sort them first according to their color and then select every third individual. Right? So then I would have, would have guaranteed that, uh, that I end up with individuals from, from each color or most likely with individuals from each color in, in my sample. Then we can also
call you know, the sampling interval. That's basically, I don't know, do I sample every third or every fourth or every fifth individual, every tenth individual? That's what we call the sampling interval. And it's calculated in a very simple way. You know, it's really just the population that you have divided by the number of people that you want to have in your sample. So you know, I have 12 individuals here, and I want to have four individuals in my sample. So 12 divided by four is three. So my sampling interval is three. OK, so that's um, systematic sampling. Now, the next one is the stratified sampling. And that's the stuff where I had the question about at the beginning, which was, to be honest, a, a tricky question. Yeah? Should, should the individuals in strata be homogeneous or, or should they be heterogeneous? So stratified sampling is this idea that um, first you, you divide the entire population into different groups, into different subgroups, or we call them strata. Yeah? It's basically just different subgroups. I have all the students here. I first divide you in males and females. Yeah. I separate you, and, and this is where I know they are the males and they are the females. And then in the next step, I go and I use another procedure, maybe random sampling, maybe systematic sampling, for each one of these different groups. That's the whole idea. I first separate individuals according to groups, and then I select within that group maybe with systematic sampling, maybe with, uh, with random sampling, the amount of individuals that I want to have, and often then we have that proportional to how many individuals there are in the population. Right? So let's say, to spice this up a little bit, let's say instead of a 50-50 split, we have more females in this class. Let's say we have 60% females and 40% uh, males in this class. Let's say, let's make it simpler again, let's say there are 100 individuals here. 60 females, 40 females, and uh, I want to have a sample of 10. Yeah. So I want to interview 10 of you guys. How would I do that with stratified sampling? If I use, now, now you need to remember, you stratify according to certain attributes. And this could be, could, be, could be sex, it could be age, it could be ethnicity, it could be all these different things. Now let's stratify according to sex. So I have these two groups. Now there are 60 females and, 50, and, 40, fem and 40, 40 males. Then I want to have 10 individuals. So I think about, okay, what is the proportion? There are 60% females, so I should also select 60% of the individuals in my sample from the female group. So then I go and then I select six, in, six individuals from the female group. And the overall proportion of the males is 40%, so I go to my male group and I select 40% of the individuals in my sample from there, and 40% of 10 is four, so I select four males from the male group. So I end up with six females and four males in my sample. So there I've stratified according to, according to, to sex. But that could be according to a whole bunch of other things, and you can combine these things. And that's actually what people do, they have subgroups. Let's say um, Irish females, let's say, uh, I don't know, Females from the UK, uh, females from abroad, uh, elsewhere, the same for the males. Right. So instead of having just two groups, now I have a whole bunch of different groups. And for each one of those groups, I can, I can uh, look at what is the proportion of that group in the overall population. And then, depending on that, I select more or less individuals from that particular group. But there you see, you already, <coughs> for, for that to work, for that to work, you need to know you need to know the overall distribution in your population. I need to know how many, how many males and females are there in this class. Without that, I cannot, I cannot stratify, I cannot calculate this proportion of how much I should select. Right? That's where, where this total information comes into play, or where last time I, I showed you my, my census stuff, actually I'm excited about that. Yeah? I hope you fill it out. Actually, I'm going to deliberately not fill it out because I want to see how their sampling procedure looks like, and I want to see how they follow up on these kind of things, so that I can tell guys next year about how the census is done in Ireland. But you please fill it out. You know, I have a scientific interest in that. Uh, actually, it's funny. I once ended up in the census in the US as well, when I was living there, and they did sort of the same thing. And those guys, you know, well, they're being paid for that, but it's incredibly important. They knock at your door again and again and again, you know many times and then they call you and they really chase you down and so uh, you better fill it out in the first instance because they, they, they are not going to give up that easily. 
because it is incredibly important to have that information, to do all these things here, because without that, we couldn't do that. Okay, so here I have an example. Now I have this hypothetical, this hypothetical uh, um, uh, population of individuals. Now I have sorted them, clearly, first all the males, and then all the females. That's sort of, you know, this grouping. And then, so this is sort of my, my stratas that I have first. And then I can use another procedure within these stratas to select individuals out of that. Right? I could use simple random sampling, or actually what happens here. Now I'm using, um, uh, or this is, again, this is an example from the Baby book. Uh, here, systematic sampling is being used. Okay. So again, we start somewhere at random with the third individual and then select every tenth individual from there. And these are the ones that end up in, in your sample. And now here we are. This is sort of coming to this question that I had at the beginning. When you do stratified sampling, you want to have your groups homogeneous. You want to have them, you want them to be the same because then you go and then you, you, select, you select individuals out of these groups and by choosing then some individuals out of this group and having them sort of the same, you assure that in the overall sample, you reflect, uh, you get a representative sample for these characteristics. That's, that's the idea. Advantages, um, it assures representation of all groups in a sample. Right? So think about what cannot happen here when I stratify according to things, that I end up with only males or with only females, that cannot happen. Um, and uh, disadvantages are that you need to have informations about uh, these, the proportions of these stratas to, uh, to, to begin with. And this can be costly. Yeah? Census data collected, it's really costly. That's sort of why it only happens every five or 10 years sometimes. And then that information is being used for the next 10 years as a, as a base to think about what the proportions here are. Okay, so that's probability, uh, that's uh, stratified sampling. Now the last one that I want to briefly mention is cluster sampling. Cluster sampling is also used a lot. Cluster sampling is essentially the idea that there are some natural groups out there that I can sample first, and then I select individuals from these groups in the next stage. Where this is used a lot is actually with city blocks. So let's say, for whatever reason, I, I don't know who ever lives, uh, or the people, have, I don't have a list of everybody who, who lives in a certain house. So what I can do, I can, I can ask uh, the folks who do the census, I can ask them, okay, go to, uh, to, um, to the second city block, and then go to the first floor, go turn left, go to the third apartment that you have there and ask the second person in the household. Something like that. Now that's a multi-stage multi cluster sample. And that's practical when, when, when it's impossible, uh, uh, when, when you don't have a list of the complete target population. And for cluster sampling, you know, there's sort of this idea that your, your individuals, that they are grouped in a natural way somehow. Right? Maybe the way you guys sit. So that would be a cluster sampling. I first, I first sample, I don't know, uh, guys in the middle, on the left, or on the right. That's sort of my first cluster that I select. And I can choose that randomly. I roll a dice. And then I randomly, let's say I select this group here. So I randomly then, in whatever way, maybe through random sampling, or through systematic sampling, or in, in another way, in a second stage, I then choose, let's say, the third row from the top. Right? And then I say, okay, let's roll a dice another time. Let's say I select uh, the third individual from the left. That's sort of how this, how this, procedure, how this procedure goes. This is a multi-stage clustering procedure. And there are two, two ways you can do that. Well, first of all, it's a, it's a, it's a simple one-stage cluster sampling. In that case, you would select your cluster and you would get everybody in that cluster. Yeah? Let's say I want to know something about students in, um, at UCD, so I select one class, one lecture, and I interview everybody in that lecture. That's a one-stage cluster sampling, because there's no second stage here, right? A, a two-stage cluster sampling is, if I would, let's say, I select one cluster first, and then within that lecture, I select some individuals. That's then a two-stage cluster sampling, and that's often uh, used with the city blocks. Uh, the idea is begin by selecting a sample of the clusters in the first instance, you know, like city blocks, 
then make a list of elements, in this case households, and select a sample of elements, persons, from each of the selected clusters. Advantages of this cluster sampling is that it can be used when a, when a complete list of population elements is difficult, costly, or impossible to obtain. Um, that doesn't mean that individuals don't have a predisposed pr probability, right? Because I know there are that many city blocks in there, and uh, I know there are that many people living in these houses, although I don't know where everybody is living, I can, I can say, say, okay, with that probability, choose that city block, with that probability, then choose the second floor, and so on and so forth. Right? So that's an advantage. That disadvantage can be um, um, generally less precision than other sampling strategies. Um, clusters need to be heterogeneous, especially when you only select, or when you only have a one stage. So let's say, to, to make that clear, if I want to know something about students in, uh, in, in Ireland and I only look at students who attend this class and I ask every one of you some questions about what your opinions about the world are and so on, it might be, it might be if you guys are all similar, then I get a very narrow view of this. So that's why I want to have these clusters to be heterogeneous, very different, so that I get a good representation of the overall population. While with stratified sampling, what sort of you first group them and then you pick individuals from each strata, and that sort of generated this representation. Okay. So that's what we had about uh, probability sampling. Um, I have some more stuff about mode, median, and mean, but again, I don't want to rush this right now, so I'm going to, to bring that up next time, and then we will talk about that, bring it together with sampling again, and enter the wonders of, um, of making inferences. Before we stop, let me give you the reading for next time. Actually, you can also follow up on the reading, do again the reading for today, but this is sort of some additional reading for the next time, and then no lecture next week. Okay, thanks very much.